condition, critical condition on YouTube. I think CC Buckle will show up on YouTube as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Robin is the host of uh, the show Girl Talk. So I appreciate your time, Robin. Thanks for coming in. And I'm talking to you today from your home in Ireland. Is that right? No, okay. uh, I live I live I live in Europe, but I don't actually give out my exact location. Oh, okay. It's a, it's a mystery. People like to guess. Uh, my accent is a little weird because I'm from Newfoundland. A little and weird. And I did I did I used to live in Ireland, so I guess you can you can eliminate that one. Well, <laughs> I sometimes lovingly ref well, I refer to your accent as something very interesting across between. Uh, is Newfie offensive? I don't. I'm tired no, of no, worrying about all. offending people. You know what I mean? Newfie isn't. Uh, so uh, <laughs> you know, I my name is Irish as well, Fannin, but uh, you know, I don't have a whole lot of connection to my ancestry, which mm. you know I hope to catch up on one day. But uh, you know, it was just not something that was culturally available in my home, and that's fine. Mm -hmm. It's so many generations down. Uh, you know, it's almost like. How do you how do you expect to know it? And when you're mixed away, exactly. well, it find uh, I find out that somebody did an uh, uh, an ancestry search. Uh, my father, who's almost seventy five now, had a long lost older sister he didn't know about that tracked him down after he was about seventy years old. Yeah, out of nowhere, Sc Amazing. scandal. Yeah, complete scandal. <laughs> um, and and so they did their research, and, and turns out, I mean, we always knew that we had distant cousins like Robert Goulet. But Goulet runs really deeply in my heritage. And I'm like, I had no idea I was that French. And that's not, it just doesn't sit well with me. <laughs> no offense to the French people. That's really funny. I uh, did yeah. I did my um, my 23 and Me yeah. about a year ago. Because I was, I mean, I've always known um, that I am I have uh, an Irish and kind of English background because I'm from Newfoundland and all of us from Newfoundland have that similar kind of mixture between English and Irish. But um, just out of curiosity, because um, I didn't have much actual details about my, my family, I did the 23andMe and I found out that I have, um, I think it's 12% of my DNA is also French German, which was, it was a big shock to me. Uh, to be honest, because <laughs> I'd always I had always more identified with the with the Irish English side of things, but it's in there. It's but, in there. especially when you it. say but, it's really there when you say but. <laughs> so just start at the beginning, if you could, and tell us a little bit about where where you started out, how you got here, who, and just give us a, a good primer and foundation on who you are. Okay, well, um, as I said, I'm a newfie. And um, I was raised in Outport, Newfoundland, in a very tiny little um, dying fishing community, which now really just survives on tourism alone. And I was raised in a very uh, Christian and conservative household, which at the time I found very restricting um, and, you know, wanted wanted to go explore the big wide world out there and uh, get some adventure growing up in such an isolated uh, place for my entire life. And so I did that. And I ended up in uh, Ontario for five years before I left Canada. And I did my liberal arts degree. And there was that was where I got my, um, I mean, I call it my indoctrination, <laughs> uh, which I have since deprogrammed um, myself from having, but that was where I sort of got my liberal outlook on life. And that stuck with me for, um, well, yeah, the whole time I was in university. There was a very heavy liberal bias in, at my university. All my friends were liberal. And so this kind of, um, it made it difficult to, re even more difficult to relate to my family because I, I, found, I felt like I, I knew everything, right? And I had, I had the new hip knowledge and my parents and the grandparents were sort of stuck in the past. So, um I guess fast forward to around 2016, I'm, I'm living my, my liberal, millennial, carefree, live in the moment lifestyle and um, quite directionless, pretty unhappy, to be honest, uh, with where my life had, had brought me to that point, you know, um, not really taking responsibility for myself, um, running in circles that weren't a good influence on me, having a few addictive tendencies, which, you know, I made excuses for and the Donald Trump thing was kind of like um, it woke me up out of a slumber that I was in 
I mm, guess, okay. you know, because it was shocking to me that, that this was happening to begin with. And I was surrounded by all liberals. They they really disagreed with uh, Trump. And so I obviously looked into some of the debates and stuff, and I found myself really enjoying his takes on things. Um, and that was surprising to me. It was disorienting to me. And it pushed me back towards my family because they got it, you know, straight away. Um they, my, my father is an American and he, he really, he really loved Trump right from the beginning. So I began sort of revisiting, um, conservatism from the perspective of, um, various, uh, influences in my family, you know, from my father, my grandparents, my mother, and then through this sort of alternative media community that I found on YouTube, which sort of opened my mind up to just a, a, a different way of looking at things that I had never been exposed to, um, and a critique of the liberal um, opinions that I had that I found to be very uh, cathartic. In you know, I felt like there I was released from a lot of the ideas that I had gathered over the years and in university. And then as a result, I was inspired to kind of make my own content from the perspective of someone who was, you know, raised quite traditionally and conservatively lost their way and has come back to it. And so, um, yeah, that's kind of, that's kind of what my focus is on my channel is just uh, making a case for traditionalism, uh, right wing ideas, and uh, traditional femininity, motherhood, family, um, things that I think, um, you know, would have been normal and you know, kind of intrinsic to everyday life back in the day. But I think as a society, we've lost touch with those things and they need re reiteration. Do you find that there's a difference? And I, I kind of share a similar path, uh, path as you from the standpoint that I'm hearing that you're kind of red-pilled. That I, you know... And, <laughs> That's and, the word we use. Yeah, yeah and... I, they're trendy terms and, and they're applicable and we have stereotypes for a reason. They're, they're accurate. And, uh, I, in 1993 was introduced to the green party. I fell in line with their platform. It's very leftist. Mm -hmm. I'm still left on a lot of social issues, but mm -hmm. I've changed my mind on important issues like uh, abortion. I'm not sure exactly where I land now, what's right, but I know I'm completely against late term abortion. Uh, I can't. I can't understand how anyone would shout your abortion or be proud to say, "Yeah, I had one, and you should try it too." I just, it's crazy. I made the comment the other day that here these activists are these pro-abortionists or pro-choicers, and then and guaranteed they're out in front of Marine Land protesting a freaking dolphin in a cage. Like you can't have it both ways. And and similarly on capital punishment, I don't know that I've completely reversed 180. But I kind of feel like no man has the right to take another man's life now. All life has intrinsic value. And maybe if you're a mass murder, I'm not sure. But I'm just against just the, the concept of killing another human being. So, um, and I found it very, you, you called it disorienting. I, 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 you know, I'm traditionally a very loyal guy. I'm loyal to my, to my woman, to my, to my God, to my sports teams. Yes, and I course. didn't know that I would feel so much pain coming off of what I once considered to be truth. Yes. And now I ha and now I have a you know I have to give myself some credit because I've grown. I think I've grown in wisdom and and I'm not 24 anymore. <laughs> and and I, I I say all that to ask you the question, do you think there's a difference between someone like your father that's grown up traditionally conservative mm -hmm. and someone like us that's grown up and I think we're born into left and right, men and women, you know, the big five. There is science which says yeah. that it can be, you know, sort of hereditary. Um, hereditary, hereditary. Yeah, no, definitely that yeah. you're programmed in the big five, you know, if, you, if, you, yes. if you're into that kind of thing. And we can talk about your aspects and, and what you kind of, I mean, I'm off the charts, enthusiasm, creativity, <laughs> like all, and very low in politeness, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, <laughs> um, but I wonder if you see a difference or uh, logistically out there in the world, a difference between the people that grew up traditionally c conservative and have never changed. And I, I think there's a lot less, w w what color is the pill when you go from conservative to liberal? I think that doesn't happen as much as the you liberals are coming know. right. And, you know, the whole saying is, Oh yeah, if you don't vote left, you have no heart when you're young. And you know, when you're grown up, if you don't vote conservative, you've got no brain. 
I, I like that yeah. now because it kind of says speak to me as being super smart now. And I wasn't so much before. <laughs> I have no problem saying, hey, I was young and idealistic. But I, I wonder if you see a difference in the person, in the people that have experienced this red pilling, you know, contrast that with people that just grew up conservative and stayed that way their whole time. Uh, I think if there is a, a, an element to like personality trait that would indicate someone who would be more likely to change their views, it would be um, openness or oh, openness great, to, ex great to experience, mm -hmm. right? Um, those characteristics tend to be associated more with liberal types, right? Mm -hmm. Being open to ideas and that right. kind of thing. But as the left has become more and more authoritarian, people who are genuinely open-minded um, find themselves being a little bit uncomfortable with what the left has has uh, turned into and what, yeah. what it now represents. And so I think that there's a natural kind of pushing away of people who are who are genuinely open minded uh, from the left to what um, the radicals is now the conservatives extreme. because the conservatives are the only ones who are actually advocating for true freedom of speech, mm, right, and true openness of ideas and and true uh, debate. In the public space, so I think I think that has a lot to do with it. Yeah, and I'm glad you said that because I, I mean I was a lefty because I felt like they were more you know you come from the '60s even into the '70s the left was seemed to be the one championing freedom of speech and now you you can't say those things because it's hateful and someone's mm -hmm. going to get their feelings hurt and mm -hmm. I'd really love to <laughs> to you know I've been watching too many Tim Pool videos lately but it's just um, <laughs> it, it, it's enraging me from the standpoint that one. Don't, I don't have any guns, but don't take my guns and don't try and limit my speech. The, like the, yeah. If we can just get clear on those things, I think we, I'd feel a lot better, but the left those doesn't two, seem to be those championing Those two things those. are integrally tied as well, because mm -hmm. if you don't have guns, how do you expect to defend your speech? Mm -hmm. you know, there's a reason why the First Amendment is speech and then the second one is, is you know, to arm yourself. It's, they, they, they relate to one another. In that your speech is automatically threatened if you have no means of self-defense. Mm, great. Talk to me about what you see happening in in the the limiting of free speech. The big tech taking big swipes. You know, Alex Jones and these guys have all been right. They're like Alex Jones is only the first, mm -hmm. and I I was like, yeah, you think? And now mm -hmm. we're seeing, you know, broad strokes of banning and count de deactivations. Another one today of uh, you know. Educational, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, I think what's really ironic about these waves of censorship is that they're done in an effort to de-radicalize the digital space, right? They, they, people make the argument that um, you know the youths are being radicalized. We're trying to prevent random acts of violence and, and this kind of stuff. Um, uh, we need to we need to remove these these sort of hate speech uh, thought criminals from our platforms, uh, and I, I I don't think that it's necessarily nefarious. I don't think that they're lying that they think that they're doing that. But what I think is ironic is that um, I think that this will result in more radicalization of people because when um, Jordan Peterson has a really good quote that he says the alternative to negotiation is war. And if you take people out of the conversation, you, you make them feel like they have um, nowhere to go. Their voice isn't being heard. Uh, they feel like no one is representing the ideas or values that they hold dear. What do you think is going to happen to that person? They, of course, will be radicalized. Um, so I think that this is going to be, I mean, the censorship issue is going to be um, it's going to get much, much worse. You know, I think that we're going to see um, right, what they're doing with the with the, the larger accounts is they're paving the way to do a wide sweeping mm. censorship, I think, of all the little accounts afterwards. Because if they start with the little accounts, that builds momentum. Right. And then they have the big guys up there that can support them and, you know, br bring awareness to this. But if they take all the big guys out first and no one says anything, you know, mm -hmm. and they get away with it. It's, you know, a matter a matter of, you know, pushing a button, essentially, and all the other little guys are gone, too. So I think we need to move to alternative platforms. I think people need to start mm -hmm. setting up their uh, their BitChute accounts, their Gab accounts, their Telegram channels, 
and uh, prepare for the worst. Personally. Amen. I just looked into BitChute today, but I mean, I've got 400 videos on YouTube. That's not easy just to transfer over. I'm sure they don't have it just an easy transfer button. You have to get them down. You have to transfer them, move them over, upload them all again. I mean, and uh, as much as I'm tied to Google, uh, I find Gmail to be crazy easy. Uh, YouTube is, you know, where I get all my information now. Uh, I, I very rarely listen to my traditional um, uh, terrestrial radio uh, talk mm -hmm. show, my AM talk show that I I never, I mean, I wouldn't leave the dial or the website from streaming that show 9 to 12 every day. Mm -hmm. Now I find it, it's almost like, well, I should we should tune in, but maybe I'll just do it after this Tim Pool video or this, you know, Rogan interview or something. It's just, <laughs> you know, uh, and strangely for a guy that kind of, you know, has a mind like an air traffic controller, I can sit in one spot and listen to hours and hours and hours. Like long form is perfect for me. And they were all like, no, no, if you, if you don't make two minute videos, no one's going to watch. Well, wrong again. Look at Joe yeah. Rogan. He's the biggest thing on, on, uh, on the internet now as far as talk yeah. shows go and he's all three hour conversations so in that same line of thinking I don't know how good you are at predicting the future but how do you see it going and see I see that Western civilization and their democracies now seem to be swinging back right uh, yeah. we've seen it in uh, some provinces uh, I hope we see it federally and I'm not a conservative voter I, um, I mean, Max Bernier speaks to me more than anyone now, I guess, uh, only because of the weak leadership of the Conservative Party of Canada, and don't even start me on Justin Trudeau. Wow. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I was talking to a friend of mine, uh, Greg Vesna. He's in the ammonia business, so trying to get it off the ground. What a nightmare for the last 25 years. And even he helped Justin get elected. Even he was hopeful when he was elected. Even he was thinking... Okay, well, 50-50 gender, yeah, okay, yeah, that's that's nice, I'm hopeful, and then he just, he just gave it to us, and it just made me so much more cynical, because I'm not a liberal voter, never have been, uh, I, I vote green, last time I voted none of the above, because my friend Greg, same guy, started a party, because they wouldn't put it on the ballot in Canada or Ontario, you should mm -hmm. be able to vote for none of these turkeys, so he started yeah. a party called the none of the above party, so how do you think it all plays out, you know, politically and even with the big data or the big tech, you know, the censorship? It feels like we're moving back right again. And I'm not a supporter of Doug Ford. I can't hardly stand what he's doing. But I'm so pleased to see him undoing everything the left did while they were in power for 12 years. It's just a it's like. You know, if you didn't complain about false majority governments before, it looks good on you. Because here comes Doug Ford with his 46% popular vote, he, and he's mashing it down your throat. So I wonder if you've got any ideas on how this all plays out. I know the pendulum's got to swing back and forth, and I also can, can see right now that a lot of people get hurt that are in the way of that pendulum when it swings back. I'm just wondering if you, yes, if you see uh, it, the, you know, what the future looks like. I think uh, it's going to be different for different countries, um, especially if you're talking about like because you know Western Western societies would would include North America as well as Europe, and there would be um, populist movements of varying degrees which are gaining momentum all across Europe. Um, for Canada specifically, I don't have a ton of hope personally as someone who. Uh, I, I feel that I am a g genuinely right-wing individual. Um, I don't really like even the word conservative anymore because the conservatives in Canada are not conservative. They're liberals, right. essentially, mm -hmm. right? You know, they don't actually, they don't, they don't have any conservative policies. So, um, I mean, with Canada, I'm not, you know, I'm just not really hopeful. I think personally that um, if you are a Canadian and you, you are feeling this shift towards the right, the best thing that you can do is to get active in your local communities. Escape the cities, you know, if you can. I understand that's not something that everyone can do, but um, bringing things back down to the local level. Mm -hmm. A lot of good can be done in your neighborhoods and in your communities to um, help, you know, the, the people who are in our country who are struggling you know, and there are a lot of them, actually, that they get overlooked in the in the sort of the big government extravaganza that's constantly, you know, distracting all of us. Mm -hmm. 
from the functioning of our society. So, I mean, the, the problem for me with regard to the future of Canada is that there isn't a single politician that has a common sense position on immigration. And so if that issue, if that issue was going to be um, discussed in a realistic way, I would be open to listening to whoever it was. Okay. Whether they were they whether they presented themselves as a liberal or NDP or the Ber, Ber, um, Ber, the PPC I think yep. People's People's yep. Party of Canada I mean the thing is like I I don't I, I I'm not quite as loyal I guess as mm-hmm. you are with regard to which party I'm voting for oh, I if find myself is, less and less loyal these days I tell you and Max Bernier I think has yeah. got a strong position on immigration I don't know how detailed it is but he's the only one saying well, you know we, we can't number. do this we, anymore we need a number with regard to the immigration mm-hmm. right like how many how many are we talking a year and I think the lowest number I've heard from any uh, Canadian politician is upwards of 300,000 mm-hmm. maybe a little bit less than 300,000 that to me is too much. When we have veterans on the street, we have tons of immigrants and refugees which currently need quite a lot of assistance Mm -hmm. already in our country. Um, Taking in more is irresponsible because not only can we not provide them with the care that they need, we can't provide our own people Mm. with the care that they need. Um, So, yeah, to to me, the immigration issue is, I'm I'm kind of a one-issue voter. Oh, are you? Okay. Well, how do you, you know, re- resolve that with the argument that, the, you know, these people come into our country, they're only on our social services for a couple of years before they're, in fact, paying taxes and being productive members of society as well? I mean, well, we're not having not babies anymore. Based, we don't have a- uh, based on my my knowledge, and now maybe I, maybe I shouldn't make uh, claims that I, because I haven't looked at these studies and these reports in a long time, but I'm pretty sure you can go to the Government of Canada website and look at the difference in percentages of people who would be visible minorities and immigrants. And um, you can see who is and who isn't um, on welfare, basically. And there is a there is a lot of them. There is a lot of them. And the, the thing the thing is, like, I'm, I'm all for helping people in need. But that's not what the, the welfare system is for. You know, people pay into the welfare system over generations. You know, it doesn't make sense to have someone come in, be here for two years and then be availing of the taxes that have been paid by pe- by families who built this country. Mm. You know, you know I mean? hear that argument all the time. I'm getting I'm 65 paid into social, um, you know, old age, whatever we call it, CCP my whole life. And these guys walk across the border illegally mm. if they feel like it. And they're getting more money instantly than I get on an old age security pension. Uh, after paying into it for 65 years. I, I mean, I don't know how to counter that argument other than, you know, I've given you a well, couple of ideas. The, but. the truth is that the elite just don't care about these people. The, the, the lie that the people who are importing these underprivileged refugees and economic mi- migrants into Canada do not actually care about them. They're importing their voter base. Mm. It's, it's true by every metric that immigrants vote more liberal Mm-hmm. Um, than the uh, old stock Canadian or the original um, American demographics of the country. They always tend to, well, sometimes they're quite split, actually. I think it's, it's, it's been quite 50-50 among the white and European descent demographics. Um, we tend to not vote in, in sort of homogenous blocks quite as often. But the immigrants, they, they genuinely do tend to vote more liberal. And so it's in the liberal government's interest to import as many of them as they can so that they can secure a voting base for themselves. Mm-hmm. Awesome. So I guess uh, I, my, one of my favorite questions for my guests is what uh, some of the uh, conversations that we're not having or having badly that you think mm-hmm. are at the top of the list. I guess you put immigration at the top of that list. Yeah, absolutely. Because I think everyone is making everyone is making kind of arguments that are – most of the time, it's just like, I want to show how virtuous I am, you know, and that's happening on both the left and the right. And the reality is that, you know, people who are at the bottom of society, who are working class people who are struggling to find jobs, struggling to get on their feet are the people who are most negatively affected by um, waves and waves of mass immigration. And I don't think that our government is even remotely 
able to um, properly help the people that they're importing. So Mm -hmm. I think that it's kind of a disaster, a disaster situation for, for everyone. You know, the left will make the the claim, oh, you know, it's, it's, it's bad. It's bad for, um, it's, it's bad for the immigrants if we don't let them in. And the right will say, well, it's bad for us if we do. But really, I mean, like it genuinely is bad for everyone. It'd be much better. It'd be much better off sending support to people in their home countries so that they can build and, you know, secure stable societies for the countries that they live in then import them and put them on welfare. You know, that's, that doesn't seem like a, a proper long-term solution to me. And what's kind of, where do you find this? I'm having a hard time looking at London and places uh, mm-hmm. in the UK and thinking like, I've never been there. I can only go by the media reports that I see, but a massive, massive sh- uh, immediate shift in numbers mm-hmm. and, and, and culture. You know, it mm-hmm. seems like they, they're struggling with a real, class of cultures of people that aren't assimilating or are not blending yeah. in the communities they're taking them over and I mean mm-hmm. that to me I mean I look across the pond and go well wow that that could be Canada and that doesn't sound like a like a good thing and I, I don't find myself overtly racist or intolerant of other societies uh, no. but you, you I mean you look at some of the real cultural issues over there now and it's like you walk through neighborhoods that you just don't recognize anymore compared to even yeah. five years ago. Yeah, you, child child marriages are on the rise in the UK right now. Female genital mutilation is on the rise right now in the UK. Stabbings are on the rise in London right now. Um, there's, there's a ton of tension right now between the LGBT community and the Muslim community. Really? Which tend to be, um, well, you know, very, very um, devoted Muslims, people who are um, less, you know, less moderate or westernized Muslims tend to be kind of homophobic. If you, well, if you yeah, look guess, at yeah. a lot of a lot of, you know, like very extreme Islamic countries, they tend to be very, very uh, violent and hateful towards people who are in the LGBT community. And the LGBT community is attempting to get you know, sex ed programs, which deconstruct gender um, and normalize um, normalize those sorts of things in the minds of children, which I actually don't agree with personally. I don't I don't think that children should be learning these things in school. I think those are conversations for parents mm. and kids to be having. And so there's this clash between, you know, very uh, conservative Muslims, which don't believe in um, homosexuality as something which will ever be valid, and the LGBT community, which are trying to um, spread awareness and educate on the things that are important to them, right? So there's like this very fundamental clash of ideas uh, between these two cultures, and that's just one example of how mm-hmm. the sort of social order is breaking down in the UK. Okay. You know, I kind of, I kind of, I developed, I think, a false impression that the left and right was further divided, they, that might be true, and that we're at each other's throats more than we ever have been. I'm, I'm quite sure that's not true. I mean, we, we have had mm-hmm. civil wars where we were much more divided. Uh, and I kind of fell for that idea also with men and women, that men and women seem to be all like violently wide apart and then at each other's throats more than they ever have been. I've come to the conclusion since then and kind of did some, a deep dive on the big five and, and learned a lot trying to solve this issue and I came up with the idea that mm-hmm. no it's just the extremes the radicals on on the tail ends of the distributions that have the, a really loud voice now with social media and mm-hmm. they've convinced the 95 of percent of us moderate moderates in the middle who are silent that say nothing that they speak for the majority when they when they really don't and mm-hmm. you know going back to this idea like I think the Jews and the Christians and the Muslims all need to have a, a, a really important conversation about how we're moving forward. And, you know, mm-hmm. religious attention has been around since the beginning of man. I get that. And sometimes even the gods change. You know what I mean? Um, and, and left and right politically, men and women politically, this idea that, nope, you're a bigot, you're, you know, the name calling and we're done. I mean, what What's going to have to take place? And I wonder... 
do you buy into the idea that the moderate middle needs to be mobilized and needs to get active and part of the conversation? Because right now we're just leaving it to the wackos on, on both ends, both of which most of us in the middle are looking both back to bo both sides going, would you guys all shut up? You're idiots. <laughs> like we don't, we're not like that. You know, we're not radical and extreme like that. Um, I mean, I, the middle, no. I mean, like personally, uh, I think, I think that the truth and what's right can be found on the right side. I guess that would make me further right than you are. Mm -hmm. And I kind of feel a little bit of um, irritation with people who won't take a side sometimes. And I'm not, I'm not talking about you or anything like that, but um, I think the fence sitters and the, the, the kind of, you know, people are just like trying to calm everything down it serves a purpose because we don't want, we don't want people like literally fighting each other. It's always horrible when you see people, you know, who are protesting and then it just comes to like people literally punching each other. Like that's not solving anything, but a genuine debate needs to occur. A genuine conversation needs to occur. And that's not going to happen if you have this liberal bias in our consumer culture, our, um, you know, news media in the education system um, now being play, put into the, leg, the legislation and in social media towards the left. The conversation is not being had. You know, we're not able to say, you know, well, maybe the right gets these things right and we can compromise on these things over here on the left and vice versa. But that, that's no longer happening, you know. And as the left becomes more radical, I mean, I think it's important to pick a side personally because this this to me like as i'm a christian um and for me this is as much a fight between good and evil as it mm. is a fight between left and right like a spiritual war rather than a political yeah, well, that's one. that's how it feels to me i mean mm -hmm. i could be wrong about that but that's, i have many that's people how it seems. yeah my men's group uh, often puts that context around the arguments and i think it helps for people that believe in, in a higher power whether you're a christian or not I, I'm just wondering, you know, how we how we find the tolerance, and especially I just find it repugnant that you look at the left and they claim to be all this. To to, they're not tolerant at all. They're no. dressed in black with masks on their face, marching in the street, beating people up. I mean, I I know you can find you know instances where the right has been violent too, but most like when the left does it, it's nasty, and yeah. and so there's a lot of subjects that are taboo. Again, I'm. A little less obvious and straight out there like saying abortion's wrong oh, duh everyone knows like who would we you know what I'm gonna get pregnant I'm gonna be a single mom then I'm gonna flip I'm gonna have an abortion but you know you know I think we've normalized it way too much in this late-term stuff I know it's not common but the late-term stuff gets me crazy what are the some some of the issues that you consider too toxic to even go like to talk, discuss publicly or go near? Oh, there are no topics that I'm unwilling to discuss publicly. I think all ideas, especially the ones which make us most uncomfortable, are the ones we need to spend time talking about the most because we need to find out why we're uncomfortable with talking about these things. If we let things lie under the surface, society will continue to rise in, ten like in tension, like a pressure cooker, mm -hmm. until we do actually see violence in our streets. That's not acceptable to me. I don't want people to be feeling like their views aren't being represented and being heard because, as I said before, this is what radicalizes people, mm -hmm. you know. And if someone has uh, bad ideas, ideas that aren't based in reality, ideas that are genuinely hateful or hurtful to some people, it's important that that person is able to speak not only so that we can identify them and keep an eye on them, mm. but so that we can prove them wrong. You know, mm -hmm. in the public space so that they don't seek underground social networks where they can become more extreme or more radicalized um, and more sort of ostracized from, you know, regular everyday people and what they believe. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I don't there's there's literally nothing that I won't discuss. Um, and if I don't know, then I'll say I don't know. I have no problem mm -hmm. saying that I don't know sure. something. Yeah, there's but no sense getting into a All ideas deserve to be spoken about. You know? Yeah, there's certainly no uh, you know, point in getting into a discussion where you're unarmed as far as knowledge goes. And that's kind of, yeah, exactly. you know, I have a, 
you know, a take on the Middle East, but I'm certainly not going to venture into that. But I don't have, well, no, I don't do know I. the I don't, solutions. Because I genuinely that, don't know. It's a very complicated mm -hmm. issue. And it kind of, you know, I, I, I've watched almost everything that Peterson did in his early work because I'm really interested in the psychology of, of the human mind. And uh, the Big Five answered a lot of questions for me. And I very rarely see him avoid a question except on the Jewish question when mm -hmm. it was a very specific question. I didn't find mm -hmm. it hateful. The guy was very respectful. He mm -hmm. says, I appreciate your work. You've changed my life, but this, 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 and this, and what do you got to say? And he walked back and forth on the stage many times before he just said, you know what? I can't do it, can't do it. or I won't do it. Uh, I think he said he couldn't do it at the time. I and usually, it, yeah. you know, I've watched enough uh, uh, Jordan Peterson to, to know that sometimes he's just not emotionally prepared. To, yeah. to take that on, and I get that. Mm -hmm. He's on the stage. Like, uh, I can't, you know, I can't blame him for saying no, but it seemed, and I think I saw your reaction to it, and I know that you were, I think, more of a fan in the early days going through his stuff yeah. than you have I mean, become. I'll always be grateful to him. Yeah. yeah. I mean, this is where the, the handle comes from, is it not? Yeah. yeah. Like, <laughs> I mean, he's had <laughs> such a great influence on so many people's lives, and then you tire, and you're like, okay, well, that's, that, that, and that all put together, and you've kind of you've come down a notch a little bit on him. So what are your thoughts on, on Peterson now? On Jordan, um, I think that he had the potential to um, do a lot more good than what he's done. I'll never, ever, um, you know, deny the fact that he was a huge influence in me um, sort of fixing my life, you know, sorting myself out. Yeah. There's this thing that he says a lot, you know, he, his um, authorship program mm -hmm. was a game changer for me. Really? Um, absolutely. I did I did it, um, the past, present, and future. You did all and three, it was right? Immense, it's immensely helpful to me. Um, his lectures on feminism were immensely mm -hmm. helpful to me because I felt like for the first time I saw an academic an intellectual expressing what I always knew and right, felt inside, right. you know, to be intuitively true. Um, that was huge for me. Um, uh, but the thing is Jordan Peterson, uh, became a businessman. Mm -hmm. He stopped being an intellectual and he became a businessman and he, uh, was taken up by a ad agency, I think called CAA. Yeah. Who, um, I mean, if people don't know about this company, they represent, you know, the biggest names in Hollywood, very strong liberal bias. Um, and there are certain things that Jordan Peterson is not allowed to speak about because really? he absolutely, you mm -hmm. know, like um, there are things that he's remained very suspiciously silent on. Are, are you aware of the, the sort of Bill Watcott hate speech? thing that's happening in British Columbia right now? Uh, remind me. I'm not sure if I do. So Bill Watcott was, um, he's a hes a Christian man from British Columbia, and he was uh, passing out flyers regarding a, I think an NDP candidate uh, named Morgan Auger, who is a trans woman who is very, very active in trying to get um, sex ed in sort of public school for the youth in British Columbia. And so Bill, being a Christian, doesn't believe that there can be a genuine transition between genders. He believes that God created man and woman, and that's it. You're born a woman, you die a woman, and that, that, that's, his, that's his belief, okay? And he was concerned about the youth, so he made a bunch of flyers and handed them out in his neighborhood saying, this is what I think about Morgan Auger. Right. Um, spreading awareness about what sort of policies Morgan Auger is going to be focusing on. And as a result, he was pulled before a human rights tribunal and fined fifty five thousand dollars. The original uh, amount was thirty thousand, um, but they tacked on an extra twenty thousand because he wore a T-shirt that uh, had a picture of Morgan Auger on it. And I think something about. Morgan Auger being born a man or something like this. Now, is is this something that I would recommend people go do? No, I wouldn't. I would. I wouldn't recommend that. Um, do I think that um, Bill has every right to express his religious beliefs during a political campaign and make his community aware of what his personal opinions are? Absolutely. I don't think that 
um, he did anything wrong personally. You know, I think it was, I think you could make the argument that it's offensive, right? But sure. like, you don't have being, a right so not being to be offensive offended. shouldn't be illegal. That's kind yeah. of my position yeah. on things, right? And Jordan Peterson was silent on this issue, which mm -hmm. I found to be extremely suspicious as he basically used the whole transgender pronoun issue with regard to Bill C-16 to launch himself into the public eye and build a name for himself on. Mm -hmm. And now here, one of his countrymen, you know, a fellow Christian man who's standing up for what he believes in is being, you know, dragged through the ringer, being fined, um, you know, immense amounts of money for hate speech. And Jordan Peterson is silent. So for me, like this is I, I I can't look at him as a hero anymore, right? I can't look at him as a positive role model even if he's going to put his book sales and his business ventures before what I believe, you know, at least originally were his convictions. Mm -hmm. So that's where the issue is. It's not that I don't appreciate how Jordan Peterson helps people because he does help sure, people. Sure, absolutely. And, and yeah. I'm one of those people. But I think he's sold out, kind of, is mm. the problem. All right. CC Bucko is my guest follower on Twitter. Um, Robin, I really appreciate the time. What? Uh, who are you watching these days? Who are you kind of, because I, you know, I was a terrestrial radio guy. And then mm -hmm. I kind of said something that a sponsor didn't like, and I found myself without that radio job anymore. And I'm, I'm in a small town, 150,000 people, uh, 400,000 in the Niagara region. And I missed it. I, st I still miss it. Terrestrial radio is kind of where I found my groove. I, I'm good at it. I like it. I did political talk, and, and I brought musicians in to play the bumper music, like live, local musicians to play the bumper music. I'm sorry that out. happened to you. That's awful. Yeah. Uh, and I'm, but then, you know, I found a little solace in, like, you got to get fired in, in, in that industry. You have to get fired. Like, I told these guys, like, it's, <laughs> it's, it's my goal for you guys to actually fire me three times. Which means you have to hire me back two more times. Like, you know, like I, I really am committed to coming back. Um, and then somebody said, well, Jimmy, why don't you do a podcast? I'm like, come on. Everyone and their brother does a podcast. And they are going, well, is Joe Rogan everyone's brother? I went, who? Like, seriously, a few years ago, I didn't even know who Joe Rogan was. <laughs> and so, you know, I got I went really deep on him. One of the first guests I had was the Iceman, um, the Swedish guy with the breathing techniques, mm -hmm. um, Wim, Wim Hof. And then very soon after that, uh, uh, the guy that uh, is into Stephen Kotler came up with this flow, how to get into the flow. So you got you got writer's block. Here's how you get into that mode where you're sinking every ball on the pool table. You just can't miss. And I found that interesting. And so I really went down the rabbit hole with Rogan, and then it wasn't long before Peterson came on Rogan. I thought, wow, yeah. what a conversation. And then I kind of slipped up. And you know who got me into this is all the, who's the first conservative talk show host? Rush Limbaugh. He was the first guy. Oh, that yeah. I, you know, and I hated him. I hated him, but I couldn't stop listening to him. He was on a Buffalo station here. And so I've gone down, and Larry King, and gone down the dial, and then Crowder, and I find myself Shapiro. I like Shapiro because he's just so objective. He really he cranks on his own party and his own people. He's really good at saying, that is stupid, Trump, and here's what you should have done. Yeah. And I don't agree with him, especially on the Israel question. Obviously, he's a Jew, but, you know, uh, and I have, and, and I, you know, I kind of tired of him lately. I've been going, Tim Pool's kind of speaking to me lately because he's really speaking to this big tech uh, censorship game. So, yeah. and uh, I found myself going, hey, Crowder, I never miss a Thursday night. I love Crowder. I think he's hilarious. Mm -hmm. And I love, you know, I always tweet, he hates Canada. He's Canadian. Don't you get the, you know. Uh, but I was just, I was getting tired. I'm like, yeah, I feel like I need something new. And then Poole came along. Yeah. So I found a little bit with Tim Poole, but I just wonder who are, who are you crushing on now or who have you faded off of? I know you're doing your own stuff so and you're bringing on your own guests. All the guys that you are, you, you just listen, listed. Um, those were, those were kind of, um, my favorites back when I was listening to Jordan Peterson. Um, and for me now, these guys are, in my opinion, these guys are very much a part of the establishment. They aren't actually addressing the issues which are most important in my personal opinion. So if you're looking for people who are really sticking their neck out there, 
Um, and you want someone who is going to talk, like, like really wrestle with those hard questions, I would look into the red elephants. Okay. Um, I saw that recently. Yeah. Red elephants is excellent. Um, there is a gentleman named, um, Dr. Edward Dutton, who is a, um, he calls himself the jolly heretic. He's on YouTube. He is, um, a professor who has been kind of ostracized from the scientific community for exploring things about race, about IQ, about right. gender, um, and he 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 really doesn't care about what your opinion is of the of the findings of the studies that he does. He really is just he's, he fetishizes the truth. That's all he cares about. And so mm-hmm. he's willing to have his reputation sort of slandered so that he can talk about the things that he's he's interested in. And I found his his work very funny um, and very interesting. So I would check out him. Um, there is a gentleman who has a channel called Black Pilled. Uh, Devin Stack, Stack is his okay. name. He primarily does propaganda analysis. So he takes, um, you know, old Hollywood movies as well as new movies and TV shows. And he does these very intricate breakdowns of um, the sort of social engineering and social programming that goes into propaganda and relates it to what we're experiencing today in modern life. And it's, I mean, his exposés are some of the best on YouTube, in my opinion. He's got like... Well over, I think he's got 200,000 subscribers right now. He's a big account, but he's a shadow banned. So you won't bump into him. Oh. He's not going to be recommended to you if you're watching Stephen Crowder, Crowder and Ben Shapiro. Okay. Wow. <laughs> he's more He's more edgy. Um, uh, who else is really good? I, I personally, I like to watch a lot of women lately because I'm doing my Girl Talk series. Mm-hmm. If there are any ladies watching who are like, you know, right wing or you're a mom or you're into traditional femininity, uh, Brave the World is an excellent YouTube channel. Um, Lacey Lynn is a traditional, um, Christian woman who's homeschooling, does lots of uh, videos about that. Um, am I, I feel like I'm forgetting someone really important. Let me prod you a little bit. Has Owen Benjamin lost his freaking mind or did he just get to a point where he thought, screw everyone. I'm going to speak what I think is truth and I'm going to scream it because I like him. I thought he was hilarious. I love Owen Benjamin. Before he, re- well, before he started just going anti-Jew, everything with the wizardry and stuff like that, I'm like, <laughs> you're like I love his wife. I saw you, you called her out the other day as to invite yes. her on the show, Amy. I just, I, he got back I, to me as well about that. And awesome. I, yeah, and it, it's probably not going to happen. He has a very protective feeling towards his wife, which yeah. I completely understand. He did a video from the bedroom yesterday, protective. <laughs> but she is just an angel. Well, Isn't she? I his see. Wife is just a sweetheart. I see that there's um, a there's a guy that can has that much courage to stand up. He has a solid foundation with his relationship. Like you, oh, absolutely. you know you can you know there's a really strong woman behind a man that yeah. will stand like that and say some of the I mean lately some of the stuff he's coming out with him. I'm still watching him less than I used to, but I'm just wondering, have you a lot but he quit drinking. I think he was, you know, he quit drinking because he was getting drunk on the podcast a little bit, you know, and um, yeah, I just I'm hesitant hesitant to um, entertain the people who say that he's crazy. I think crazy calling someone crazy is dismissive. Mm. You know, you you don't know what a person is going through behind the scenes. Um, Imagine, imagine, you know, you are like, he was like just a normie, regular guy was, you know, you know, at the top of his game, a like maybe like B list celebrity in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And because he stood up for, um, children, which is what he has been consistently doing is, is he says, you know, a a child can't be trans. Um, he was dropped from his agency, which is CAA, the same company, which represents Jordan Peterson right Mm -hmm. now. And he lost everything. Right. Um, he has, I mean, he has, I mean, if, I, I, it, you can say that, but it's so difficult to try and understand what that will do to someone psychologically, mm, you know? Amen. And I think that there are, they, like, I think he's been hurt. He's been deeply hurt by this world, this cruel, evil world. Um, and, you know, he has a, an immense amount of responsibility and he has an immense amount of kind, he, he takes that responsibility on, you know, he feels the weight of trying to protect his family so deeply. He's a very emotional person, mm-hmm. right? 
Um, and I don't mean that in a derogatory sense. He just is, he just feels deeply. And so, yeah, I think to, you know, a regular person, um, who, you know, can sit in the comfort, comfort of their ho- own home, feel safe, feel secure, go to work, you know, Monday to Friday. Yeah. He might look a little erratic. But he's not, he's not crazy. He, he, he actually says more true things than, majority of the people out there and he is funny you know Mm -hmm. i think he's really funny because he's willing to say whatever comes into his head you know you you can say whatever you will and have a have an opinion about owen benjamin um but you can't deny that he's genuine oh no absolutely he is authentic as it comes and there's uh, i've got a lot of room for people like that and i can imagine i can imagine sitting down with them you know over what would have been a beer you know and just Mm -hmm. and just having the time like it'd be like sit, I don't know, I'm not comparing the two, but I'd love to have a beer with Alex Jones. I think he's wildly entertaining and <laughs> intelligent and just his brain is like, it's, it's, I don't know how it fits in his head. And yeah, he is a little bit on the, on the extremes on some of the stuff. They're turning the frogs. Yeah, I know they always use that as a, you know, trim, uh, uh, chemtrails and all that kind of stuff. I think he'd be great to sit down and have a conversation with. And yes, he is triggering for some people, you know, I was with a couple of my Green Party friends a couple of years ago. In 06, I marched in the Pride Parade. Now they're talking about straight Pride Parade, and the left is melting down. I am ha- I'm happy I'm heterosexual. I love my woman. I mean, there's nothing, there should be nothing wrong with saying that. Anyways, I, on the trans thing, I honestly verbalized to these girls, friends of mine for many years of being in the Green Party, they're not green anymore, lots of people come and go for the Green Party, that I felt that forcing an eight-year-old into, into transition therapy with and ruining their natural puberty was child mm-hmm. abuse. I, I Like, yeah, I still feel is. like that. You can't get a tattoo until you're 16, but you can... You can change your part. Like, I just... You can sterilize yourself. Yeah, and they told... They were like... I said, a child abuse. They're like, easy, Fannin. Easy. Like, don't lose your mind. I still feel that way. And I wonder how these tolerant lefties can get behind something that seems so dangerous, especially when you look at the the rate of desisting. Like, Mm -hmm. many of these people grow out of this... And, you know, we've all heard the horror stories. I don't want to use the extreme stories all the time of the idea that, you know, your kid comes up to you while he's five or seven years old and says, I want to be a girl. And if you don't take him immediately to a psychiatrist or to a to to a a specialist that trains in in transition, that you could lose your child. Mm -hmm. That's child abuse for not playing Mm -hmm. because they want to put a dress on one day. Like Mm -hmm. I just I can't I can't see how we can move this conversation forward when. You know, no uterus, no opinion. Well, you don't, like, no, I wouldn't wish that on it. You can't. These these ideas have become mainstream. They've become a law in some countries, especially like Canada. And for people like myself, um, who is moving towards family life, the only option that I feel I have personally is to homeschool my children and to network with Christian people who are of like mind and have a very small network of people and just, you know, back away slowly from the decline, you know, because the way the left is manipulating society has a genuine momentum behind it because it's backed by the corporations, right? You're not going to stop that with, with reasonable discussions on the internet. Try how we might. We can, we can, we can do it till the wheels fall off Mm -hmm. and they will, and they will fall off. Um, and I don't think that we should stop, you know, until all of our, all of our options are taken from us. But if you're talking about, you know, the real culture war, you know, that we, we use that word, the culture war, Mm -hmm. unless you're willing to, um, get involved in local politics, you know, it's, we have a trajectory and we're moving towards it swiftly. So if you don't like where this is heading, Find a place that's rural, get out of the city, plant some potatoes, get some chickens, go to church and hope for the best. That's, I mean, that's, that's, that's what I'm doing anyway. (laughs) Awesome. Now, um, uh, you, I, I, I I think I heard you say tradcon the other, is that a derogatory way of saying traditional conservative? I think it is used as a... Okay. 
I was going to, I think it was in my open, your tradition. There might be some people who self identify as that. Okay. Traditionally conservative. Okay. But I think there might be like some, like, you know, the edgy Anons on Twitter. They're like, oh, you know, trad cons, lol, they're idiots or whatever. You know, I think it, it, it has dual meaning a little bit, depending on who you're talking to. So what do you see as a threat to our traditional Western values? I, I look at, um, I feel like, you know, Nietzsche was kind of right. Yeah, God is dead. We killed him. And mm. the blood's on our hands, and now we're going to pay for it. Now, I'm not saying that mm. everyone needs to be Christian. I'm saying as a you know a, uh, a fundamental foundation of Western society, it, it was always in some sort of God. And yeah, and as we move away from that, um, also for me, and I talked to Zuby a little bit about this this issue of fatherlessness. You know, mm -hmm. uh, Robert Bly has a beautiful video that's old. It's called the a gathering of men. I don't know if you've mm -hmm. ever seen it, but I, I think you'd enjoy watching it. And he talks about, you know, we took the man out of the field where he stood behind beside his son, and his son got this this food, this through osmosis from his father, just being next to him. He mm -hmm. got mentoring, and then you take the man and you put him in the factory, and he comes home with short patience, tired and edgy. And he's not interacting with his boy like he should be. And yes. now we've taken women out of the, we've put women in the workforce. I don't think we've fully seen the impact of that. But, you know, from a traditional point of view, and, uh, you know, I like to think I'm traditional but when it comes to, you know, God and, and family. I think those are, you know, what held the glue that held society together, especially mm -hmm. mother and father in the same house. And now mm -hmm. we're seeing a rate of, you, uh, you know, fatherlessness in the states and the black communities upwards of eighty percent. Well, who do you think is going to mentor them? So they're being mentored by gangs rather than the elders, good people yeah. that care about them. You know, uh, I wonder about your thoughts on the impact of, of that. Um. Well, it's it, it's devastating the effect that that you know rampant sort of atheism and this kind of new age woo woo kind of, um, what's it called? Um, it's like a mysticism, you know, that you get among the hippie types and the yoga teachers and, you know, the pot smokers and this kind of a thing, you know, like this is, this is sort of what's replacing politics. And that is what's replacing, you know, what traditional religion, um, you know, the role that that held, I think in society for a really long time. Um, and I'm not super, hopeful about where we're headed um, with regard to that. But I do, based on what I observe on the internet, and now the internet can never really be a perfect litmus test for what's happening in the real world, because there are tons and tons of people that, you know, are just living their lives, they're not aware of what's going on in alt media or anything. But there is this kind of shift back towards God. And I made a video about this called the God Pill. Um, which um, is the antidote to the black pill. <laughs> What's the black pilling again? The black black pill means that you're, you're you have a sense of hopelessness. So you take the red pill, you see what is happening, <laughs> in the world, right? Then you want and to then, kill yourself. And then because of that, you get black pilled, which means that you're just like nihilistic. Like what is happening? It's over, oh, okay. right? And so the antidote to this nihilistic hopelessness that many of us feel after we've woken up to the state of our societies is God. And this is a shift that's happening among the youth right now. You see tons and tons of young men who are converting to Catholicism. Um, and I'm not personally a Catholic myself. I'm an Anglican. But um, I think that there is a kind of movement about the church um, for people who are um, fed up with this kind of meaninglessness in their lives. And the thing is, I... I don't go to church just because it's good for me, even though it is good for me. I go to church because I believe in God and I believe the good guys win in the end. And so I think that there will be a drawback to the church in God's time. I think it's a part of God's plan to, you know, have the like, because there is a play to existence, you know, and I think that in order to really establish the meaning of the church and how valuable it is to us as a society and as individuals, we need to be reminded of what happens when we lose touch with that, you know? And so the world, the world is the devil's playground. Um, and it maybe will be for another couple hundred years. We don't know, right? Mm -hmm. This, this war between good and evil, 
between traditionalism and modernism has been going on for a very long time, and it will probably outlive all of us. Um, but it's important that we do our part. We don't give up hope. Um, we, we you know, trust our gut because God speaks to us all the time. You know, when you have a feeling that something just isn't right in your belly, yeah. um, you trust that feeling. And um, I'm hopeful that even if I don't see a shift back to the church, even if I don't see the kind of society that I wish we had, um, you know, in my lifetime, that that's what's going to happen in the end. Mm -hmm. So... I appreciate your thoughts on uh, seeing as though you're traditional. How do you, I appreciate your thoughts on how you measure men and women. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. what, what is the, uh, especially men, uh, what well, is I the measure of a good man? Correct, Sorry? Um, opinions when it comes to gender. <laughs> What's that? I have very politically incorrect opinions when it okay. comes to gender. All right. Um, I don't think that my opinions are without nuance. Like I, I accept that some people will not fit into the mold, but um Based on the studies that I have seen, men are, uh, they on average, right, men are more intelligent than women. There is also a larger degree of variety um, in IQ among men than in women. So you have men hmm. that some men will have like 160 IQ, right? And then some men have really, really, really low IQs, like, like, you know, 60 or like 80 or something, you know, mm -hmm. and there's a wide range of variety of more people in, in the middle part. Right. And their average is higher than the average of women's. And then they have this gene, these, a lot of geniuses. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and if the feminist would have you believe that there are no female geniuses because of God, patriarchy, patriarchy. <laughs> right? No, that is no, that's not true. It's a, it's a biology thing, right? Yeah. It's a drive um, women thing. On yeah. Average tend to not have, as much variation on the ends of the bell curve, right? And we're more we're more huddled towards the middle, mm -hmm. and our average is lower than men, right? So there's that biological difference between men and women, which, I mean, when you're talking about brains and intelligence, there is a lot of debate going on, you know, even in the scientific community about whether these things can be trusted and whether or not IQ is a valid form of measurement for um, intelligence and this kind of stuff. But I do think that more so um, our bodies, our physicality is just obviously different, right? Our endocrine systems are different. Everything about us in terms of how we think, our strength abilities, our hormone levels, our reproductive uh, roles, they're different, right? We are different. And the men have an, an advantage. They tend to be smarter. They tend to be stronger, they don't have to carry babies inside their bodies for nine nine months and give birth to them, which can be very traumatic. And take care of them um, for fifteen years. And feed it exactly. Mm -hmm. Like yeah, it's 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 not fair, ladies. Okay, like I know it seems it seems like you know God has it out for us and he's picking <laughs> on us and we got the short end of the stick, but it is what it is. <laughs> Accept your role with grace and dignity. Do it with your head held high. You know, there's there's no shame in carrying burden it's what makes women so so strong and so emotionally open and available um we have our own strengths right you know we are deeply empathetic creatures um we're deeply intuitive creatures we're deeply social creatures um we're deeply nurturing creatures all things that men don't really have as much skill in mm -hmm. and if you want to play the game of what's you know the more important yeah. area of expertise, that's just relevant to me. You know, mm -hmm. I think we are complementary. Absolutely. Um, in many ways. And the differences we should accept and just get over, get over it. Yeah. It sucks. You know, if you don't want to have a baby, there are immense amount of options. You know, I, to modern I'm modern glad you said you that. You don't have to do that gestational work if you don't. Yeah. But I mean, women are designed to have babies and they think like they were designed to have babies. Men, uh, I think, are just, you know, I think being in a, in a loyal, committed relationship, I think men were designed to impregnate everyone around them. You know, I think it's, <laughs> it's a, you know, almost a construct of society that, oh, this is how we do. I don't think we're like geese. You mate once yeah. and you're together forever. You're just locked in this happy matrimony. It takes a lot of work to be loyal to your woman, to to not yes. think, oh, well, down to this green grass over there. I didn't see that before. So uh, I'm I just interested in your your idea of measurement 
the character? Like, what do you look for? And men and women, like, what do you put highest on the list? Is integrity, obviously. Communication, mm-hmm. I don't know. Where would you... When you're, um, when you're, like, if I was going to be like talking about like a, a mate or a friend, yeah, first so that, right? and then also on the other side for women, yeah. Okay, so if um if I'm looking for a mate personally because I want a traditional setup where I can be a mom because I want that, you know, shock, shock horror. I want to be a mom. <laughs> um, I want to be a stay-at-home mom. I want to be um, a homeschooling mom. So I need a man who is a provider, who wants to provide, who's not going to feel resentment because he is providing for me. I want a man who takes uh, pride in that ability to look after his wife and his children and let her fulfill the domestic role to the best of her ability. Um, That's number one. That's before looks. That's before intelligence. That's before anything, you know, wanting the same things in life, whatever they happen to be, is kind of essential um, if you are if you want a harmonious relationship. If you don't want a family life, right. then, you know, make sure you're, you're with a guy who also doesn't want family life, right? right? right. So there needs to be that kind of uh, future-oriented um, analysis. Do you want the same things? Can you move forward hand-in-hand hand towards the things that you both want? Um also, I think um, um, this is something that you really only find out about a man with time, but, um, you know, aggression and testosterone levels um, can predict whether or not someone is going to be a violent individual or not, right? And so you want to know how a man fights, right? Um, does he play fair? Mm. Is he going to get violent? Is he willing to listen to you? Um, is he going to, um, you know, dismiss everything that you're saying because you're just a woman, right? There's this, there's this stereotype, I think, that right-wing and masculine men, um, that they, they hate women and they think they're all stupid and they just don't listen to them. It's not true. Um, there's a great degree of respect. And you see that, you see that like, very easily when you watch um, like Owen Benjamin interact with his wife. He wow. honors her, right? Oh, so you yeah. want a man who's going to honor you, um, and accept his role as the head of the household. Mm. Um, and for me personally, he has to be a Christian. Um, you can tell a lot about a person, whether or not they're going to go to church with you. And um, for me, it's like it's like this safety net, because it's not like he would just be betraying me if he were to cheat on me or to lie to me or to steal from me or to hurt me. He would be betraying his God, which is far deeper punishment. Mm. And I think that, you know, to, to both to both of you be in the relationship and to be honoring each other and to be honoring God simultaneously generally provides for a very harmonious and happy relationship. Um, I think for men, um, if you're looking for a woman who you want to be your wife, um, shyness can be a good indicator of, um, you know, not being the kind of girl who, engages in promiscuous sexual relations with like lots and lots of men, you know, like a girl who sleeps with you on the first date, like, sorry to let you know, but she's, if she sleeps with you on the first date, she has done it before. She, you know, she probably will do it again. So if you want, if you want a girl who, um, is, you know, has self-respect, carries herself with dignity, how she interacts with you will give her a lot of information, give you a lot of information about how she interacts with with other men and has interacted with other men. And it's kind of, it's kind of similar. Like, is she going to respect you? Is she going to honor you and, and um, appeal to your authority in the household, you know, mm. or is she going to be bossing you around all of the time and expecting like this, everything equal, always equal. Well, you know, mm. I, I did this chore, this chore, this chore, and you only did this chore and this chore, you know, keeping tabs. This is a very womanly thing that women do. Mm. It's not, It's not, you know, women and feminists have this sort of competitive feeling, I think, between themselves and their men. Um, And this can translate into uh, the the relationship. Men don't want um, a woman who's going to compete with you, right? They want a man who's going to compliment you. Um, So also, like, does she cook? Is she one of these women who's like, I don't cook? (laughs) <laughs> and then thinks, thinks that's like a personality trait. Yeah, yeah. Like, it's like I'm always like, late. No. Well, not with me or not. <laughs> yeah. um, my my battery's quite low. Do, do you want to keep talking for a bit longer? Because I might just plug my my computer in just in case. 
Uh, yeah, we can wrap up. How much you got? Uh, I think... Yeah, I need I need to plug it in. It says it's going okay. to go to sleep if I don't plug it in. Let me just okay. grab my... No problem. My charger one second. Okay, okay. no problem. Thank you. Sorry about no that. Problem. I should have plugged it in. <laughs> oh, good. No problem. CC Bucko. Hey, um, how, uh, what lengths do you go to, to protect? I, I know you, I noticed you don't use your name very often. Yeah. Your first name. Yeah. Well, I, I understand your last name, like, um, yeah. for obvious reasons. Um, I, I, my accounts have always been, you know, um, when I had a show and stuff like that and you know a stage name is not something I, I was interested in and for yeah. heaven's <laughs> sakes drop the idea of rebranding don't rename yourself I'll never be able to no. find you a CC bucko no I, I entertained I jumped in on your tweet it's months ago and you're uh, thinking about rebranding I'm like don't never never rebrand it's a bad idea you've done so much work to brand yourself the way you have stick with it you're right <laughs> you're right it's just it, it's it's um like the, I guess the thing is, when I started this, I never expected to be able to build a following. I was just doing it because I wanted to find people who were like me, who were going through what I was going through at the time. And I felt like I was in a state of critical condition, right? Because I was going through this weird political shift. Right. Um, and so I, I didn't name my YouTube channel something for myself because I didn't even really understand how YouTube worked. I named my channel as if it was like, MSM, you know what I mean? I was like, this is the critical condition channel. And then people started to call me critical condition and it's a real mouthful, right? I'm just like, oh, no. You're just CC to me. calling me critical condition. And then I have to use CC Bucko as the alternative. And CC Bucko is just like, has this Peterson anchor to it, which annoys me. And it's yeah. just like, <laughs> sometimes it gets to me because I don't like it. And maybe someday I will just name dox myself and just be like, change my at and my channel name and my Twitter account to my real name. Uh, I might just do that. Like I I've considered it a couple times, but I'm holding off to see, you know, if my channels will even be around for much longer. Mm, um, but I think you're right. I think a rebrand would be unwise and kind of naive because people, people don't really care at the end of the day, what your account is. It's just an identifier. Right. Yeah. Well, a little bit more about you. Where do you find yourself on the big five scale? Uh, I am like 98% um, extroverted. Mm -hmm, me too. Um, I am like, I'm in the high 90s on most of them. I have like this really sort of extreme result in my personal life. So I'm very, very open-minded, very, very extroverted, very, very high in compassion. compassion yeah. um, I'm, I'm moderately high in neuroticism. Oh, you are? Okay. I have, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's just like being a woman. Like. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, but don't say that in public. That'll get, and, and, you know, people usually hear that as, oh, you're calling me neurotic. No, neuroticism is a, you know, a mental character trait is different than being. These people take themselves. Pardon? Yeah, people take themselves too seriously. Mm. People take themselves too seriously, really. I mean, like, if you can't laugh at yourself, like, you're just missing out on, like, one of the greatest joys of existence, I feel like. Mm. Um, but I'm very high in, I'm high in, um, uh, neuroticism because I'm high in withdrawal. I'm low in volatility, which is a predictor of like, you know, aggression and stuff, but I'm, I'm high in withdrawal, which means that if I'm hurt emotionally, 
or if something happens to me which affects my neuroticism, it takes me longer than the average person to recover, Mm -hmm. right? It takes me a little bit longer. So that makes me a little more neurotic and I tend to overthink things a little bit. I'm also... um, what was the? Th- I think there was a couple different degrees of openness too, because right. um, there's it's not just openness; it's openness to ideas and it's openness to experience. Right. And I'm very open in both realms, okay. um, and that's like obvious. You know, I'm I'm obviously open to ideas because that's what I like to talk about on the internet. And in terms of experience, you know, I've lived in. This is the fourth country including Canada that I've lived in in my life um I've traveled all over the world I've experienced all different cultures um for long periods of time I love trying new things um there's basically no food you could put in front of me aside from maybe like dog that I wouldn't try you know so like that's that's kind of my personality which it my personality actually predicts liberalness yeah. Um, I think it's really just that um, I was raised as a Christian and as a conservative person um, that I maybe inherited those qualities from my parents and then the environmental influence on top of that kind of solidified it for me. And conscientiousness, are you both middle of the road in that? or I am 67% oh, wow. in conscientiousness. Okay, that's good. So, yeah. um, a little, a little bit lower than I think I would have wanted, but it's something that I've actually uh, been trying to improve. And I think that conscientiousness is something that's not so set in stone. No, you right? can improve on that for sure by putting yourself into a routine, getting up every time, every day at the same time, and you know, yes, a exactly. schedule. You know, exactly. And it. I have been working on that to try and make myself a little more conscientious. Yeah, I'm uh, lowest in politeness. Hard to believe. Oh, I'm very high in politeness too. Which is <laughs> agreeableness. I'm very high in agreeableness. Really? Yeah. yeah no, like both middle of the road. High in agreeableness. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, what's next for you? What are you up to other than the show? So um, my focus right now is um, talking. So I guess talk. Well, it's talking with women on my girl talk series. I believe that there's a little bit of a gap in the market. Um, I don't mean like economically, I just mean the content's not out there. Um, That's kind of like for right-wing women by right-wing women, you know, because the right-wing tends to be a little bit of a boys club. The guys are like, you know, e-girls, like stay away, e-girls. Well, what's the e-girl? I've been seeing this in relation to Ashley Sinclair and stuff. Oh, okay, yeah. They're just being mean kind of. No, there are a lot of women actually, which like, genuinely do take advantage of their role sometimes in the movement and they tend to like sort of sell out the movement for personal gain and so the guys in the movement genuinely do have um a justified distrust i think but for those of us i think in the movement who you know we just want to be good role models for younger women we want to make a case for nationalism we want to make a case for christianity we want to make a case for traditionalism and we want to do that in a feminine way We, so I I think that I want to kind of build this little gender segregated space where women can talk about womanly things. We can talk about what's important to us from our perspective. And then the, you know, the guys don't have to feel like we're stepping on their toes or, you know, getting involved in these sort of political leadership positions, which I don't really think women tend to thrive in anyway, which I know is another shock horror uh, opinion that I have about women. They don't really do great in political uh, positions of leadership. That's just my opinion. And so... So we should just force them there with quotas and make sure that they're represented (laughs) because it's all about your genitalia. Come on. Yeah, yeah, exactly. (laughs) Yeah, we we need more estrogen in the political sphere, said no one ever. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, Um, the idea is, is... sound as far as, you know, I used to fall into this camp, if we had a little bit more compassion in politics, i.e. the feminine influence, then the world would be a better place. Yeah. But, you, I mean, you can't force people into careers and jobs that they're just not cut out for. And that's okay. You know, like, I, I don't hear the women come and yes. say, you know, there's too many women in nursing. We need to get you equal the playing field. We need more male influence than no one ever, you know, and yeah. it's kind of. Well, what you don't want your government, like, see, this is my problem is that, like, I understand where you're coming from. And I think it comes from a place of 
uh, genuine caring and good heartedness that you want to look after people. But that's not what the government is for. That's not what politics is for. Politics is about like securing the infrastructure of your society, protecting the borders, providing for like a secure economy. You want to like build your society up in a way and have a strong moral leader so that people can look after themselves Right now, there'll always be some people that fall through the cracks and we can provide services to help those people. No problem. But when the focus of politics becomes just about compassion and not about protection, um, I think you get this kind of tyrannical, um, matriarchal, um, almost suicidal element to the way that governance uh, occurs. And I think it undermines people's ability to uh, be responsible for themselves and look after themselves um, Mm. and feel empowered by overcoming whatever struggles that they may face, they may face in their lives. Yeah. Personal responsibility seems to be lacking more than ever nowadays. You know, Mm -hmm. and and we talked about this earlier. Oh, I'm always late or, you know, there's (laughs) no integrity in being late. Uh, Zuby was late the other day for our interview, shot me a quick DM and said, bro, I'm running late. And I'm like, thank you. There's integrity yeah. in that. I really appreciate it because otherwise I'm sitting here thinking I'm disrespected. What's going and, on? Like, yeah, what's going on? So <laughs> I have a lot of time for that. Um, uh, what uh, What do you find yourself? I hate the word triggered, but what do you? What are some of the issues or some of the the points of view that you look at on social media and you just go, "Oh my!" Like you, you can't even um, make time for. So the things which trigger me are things that are like. Um, you know, all white people are racist mm-hmm. or that, um, you know, European people should be ashamed of their ancestors or that it's no big deal if uh, we import so many people that we become a minority in our own nation. Um, children being given hormones, like we discussed earlier, I think is one of probably my biggest triggers uh, because I just feel this kind of maternal need to protect The children who I feel like are being genuinely abused and sold a lie and it's irreversible what's happening to them. Um, I think those are those are like the top four things, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, like being a Newfoundlander. I have a very strong sense of um, like national identity and ethnic identity, which is distinct. To, it's like it's it belongs to me. It belongs to my family and um, the people who are from Newfoundland and of Newfoundland. Mm-hmm. I don't think anyone just anyone can be a Newfoundlander. You know, we are a distinct people. And I think that it would be a, a, a big shame if Newfoundland became downtown Toronto. I'm sorry to say, yeah, yeah. I think downtown Toronto has its place in the world. No one's trying to take downtown Toronto away from anyone, but we don't want the whole world to look like downtown Toronto, you know? And I think that, um, for the people out there who say, you know, uh, you know, anyone can be Swedish, anyone can be British, anyone can be German. I just think it's not true. And I think it's, it's, it undermines the ethnic identities of European people. And I hate that. It makes me really upset Mm -hmm. when I hear that because I would, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that like, you know, it's, it would be awesome if a bunch of foreigners went into South Korea, for example, and overwhelmed that population and changed the culture forever. That would be devastating loss to the world to lose that distinct culture. Why can't we afford that same compassion to European people? Why does, why is Europe, the only place on earth that has to endure multiculturalism and the death of their, you know, original ways of life. Cause we wouldn't push it on any other place. The left would never push it on Africa or South America or Asia, but it does seem to be okay to do it when it comes to Europe. And that really upsets me because it's just like a blatant contradiction. Mm-hmm. What do you take the most guff for out there on social media? When you take a stand on something, <laughs> what do you get the most blowback from? Um, I troll a lot with, um, thanks for saying that. I just, (laughs) I stepped into the troll pool. You know, I've been getting better at it because there's a, there's a, there's a real technique to trolling. And if, if you don't know what trolling means, I guess that's just, you make uh, a statement that's designed to provoke a reaction, a predictable reaction from the other side. And I kind of troll, not that she's, I'm not trolling her personally, but AOC, I find to be, Mm -hmm. uh, a caricature um, more than anything and you know uh, 
there's a space for everyone in politics, but I, this leftist madness has got me crazy. So I trolled her the other day, and it happened to be on the John Stewart video that she quote tweeted. And I just, and this is not original. I thought it was original at one point, but I had to go back into Twitter and search the term, this mm -hmm. Alexandria occasionally coherent thing. <laughs> And that's all I said, tell us, please tell us more. And I, I put the, that name down and spelled occasionally wrong with two S's. Wow. I think my, I think my ratio is still okay because I've got 210 likes versus 150 or 60 hate comments on, you know, take the yeah. Canadian flag out of your shut up. You know, uh, this was, this was, this is why nobody wants to F you, uh, d d don't let your mother know you're an incel, like it's just, and I'm proud of myself because, you know, it's, it hurts a little bit more when my neighbor, the guy I like, goes on my Twitter account and likes a post that says you're a complete idiot. Because, because I like yeah. my neighbor, but these people, on, I have no idea who they are. I'm like, yeah. ooh, and the yeah. interaction. Like, I don't have a channel even close to to yours either There's on YouTube great or Twitter. There's honor in being ratioed. Um, <laughs> yes, to be honest, you know, because like I, I know what you mean. Like how it, it, you kind of get this sense of relief if more people support what you say, then mm -hmm. you get a reaction out of. But mm -hmm. if you're genuinely trolling <laughs> and you genuinely don't give a hoot, you know what happens, and you're just like planting this seed and then backing away from the chaos. You want to be ratioed because if you get ratioed, that means that you've you upset did, tons and tons and tons and tons <laughs> of people. I like to just like drop a little, um, all uh, women, women are property and then mute the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> all women should submit to their husbands. And then I mute did the appreciate and both of those like tweets. <laughs> <laughs> I did appreciate both those tweets very much. <laughs> and it's amazing because. As you're getting ratioed, uh, I've never had, and again, I, my channel and my Twitter account are near the size of yours, and I know there's much bigger ones than yours and uh, stuff out yeah. there, but uh, at, for the first time, my, you know, they're like, don't at me. But now I get it because for almost, well, a good 48 hours, it didn't stop. Every time okay. I, lo it was 20 notifications, 20 notifications. That's why I mute. Yeah. Oh, because, you because it can be a little bit like. I, I don't really care what you have to say. <laughs> I just wanted to have some fun. But then <laughs> with this this simple trolling and having fun, I, the, I've never had so many people come and check out my profile. I know they're yes. coming, you know, the profile clicks are like, I mean, through. I've never seen anything like it on my channel. Like usually you get, you know, 1%. This was like. That's why trolling pays. <laughs> yeah, it brings awareness to you because there were 250 people I'm, i'd say that probably between 30 and 40 percent of the people that liked your tweet were probably people that were new to your account and then maybe 20 percent of those people may have followed you as a result so it's worth it like it actually in terms of like the economics of follows yeah. it's worth it to like die on a hill for a good job. Yeah, I very rarely get that and I actually uh, a couple of weeks ago I was considering maybe they deleted that uh, anal from the analytics because I very rarely ever see anyone that followed me from this tweet. You know, or followed okay. me from this okay. reply I think would work as well. Um, mm. But you, you're right. There's ways to go. You can like everyone that you know, or add everyone that liked your post. And I, I'm fascinated yeah. by social media. And I'm honestly, uh, you know, I've given up on Facebook. I think it's passe. Even uh, Facebook. Sorry. Um, it's just it's cheap views. People are cut in and out. You get one view for somebody that stayed on six seconds. It's not a real good measurement. And I yeah. like the analytics on YouTube. Uh, I've grown the YouTube channel over the last maybe six or eight months. You know, I went from no followers or 50 followers to what I've got now is just over 100. And somebody said to me, hey, you know how many accounts out there have no followers? 100 is a real, it's a milestone. I'm like, Don't, who are you yeah. kidding, right? So, But I'm fascinated by how you build it. Uh, I committed Twitterside a couple, two, uh, about two years ago. I had 20, I was following 2,800 people. My feed was a, a absolute mess. And then I found this uh, Google Chrome extension that said it would it would take everyone that I was following in and reduce them to zero. And oh, I clicked excellent. I clicked on it, it worked. I came back from my shower. I was following no one. The problem was I lost eight hundred followers over the next few months. So now but I'm fascinated to mm. you know how you keep them, how you get them, and hey, 
you know, uh, I'm a realtor. I should probably do m more real estate and less interviews uh, so I can, you know, keep the show going and whatnot. Um, but I'm fascinated by how you build it. I know Instagram's I given up on that as well. You but have I'm to still pick an audience. Yeah. You have to pick an audience and you have to speak to that aud audience. You have to make make content for the audience you want, not the hmm. audience you have. Interesting. And just on the way out, do you have any other tips on social media or YouTube or anything like that on, yeah. on creating um, followers? So um, so for me, networking has been huge now you know, how, and how doing do you, inter interviews. How you does know? the networking you know? look outside of interviews and, and like showing up to business after five at the chamber or something like that? And say, um, hey, check out so the you, can, you can schedule tweets. So like, I mean, if you looked at my feed, it would look like I was on Twitter all day, oh. every day. But, okay. but the, I'm not actually online all of the time. Um, I schedule tweets so that, you know, there is a constant kind of bump of, of information that's coming from my account onto my followers feed. And so, um, you know, I will spend a certain amount of time on Twitter then, you know, responding to people who need responding to uh, blocking people who need to be blocked because I love the block function. Me too, eh? Like, it's think, one of my favorite functions of Twitter, to be honest. I take so um, much pride in I'm not going to block you. I'm going to make you block me. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm a bigger man. <laughs> I'm afraid that I'm going to get my account suspended for something stupid all the time because I do troll. So if anyone gives me the wrong impression, like they're kind of a jerk or maybe they're a liberal who, you know, is like kind of trying to be a reporter because there are a lot of accounts out there that just like they go on Twitter to report people that they disagree with. I just block as a uh, security kind of um, mm -hmm. thing. And then also like people who are just like, um, not, they're just being rude and they're not doing it in a funny way. Like I'm okay if you make fun of me and it's funny, like I'll even like it. Sometimes I'll even retweet it. Yeah. But um, if you're just like being a jerk and you're being rude and you just seem like a nasty person, that's it. You're blocked. Like um, it's a privilege to view my content. My content is excellent in my opinion. I, I think I have good tweets and if you're going to be disrespectful, then I'll just block you. It's as simple as that. So I think, um, there's that, but also keep it, keep, keep your, your newsfeed fresh. So if you don't want to spend all day on, um, Twitter schedule some, like write up a bunch of tweets that you think are good put them in your drafts and then you can use um a an app to schedule them to go out at a certain time so that you're you not online all of the time and then you can just go back and check them and respond however is necessary do you find that you're getting uh um if you use hootsuite or an api that schedules tweets does it reduce your impact because somebody told me oh dude you have to organically be on the twitter platform tweet from twitter because if you use hootsuite the, the social media guys know that and they de-rank your posts. You never experienced I that? I haven't experienced that personally. Okay. Um, it could be true though. Mm -hmm. Like it, de it depends on what you're used to in terms of interaction. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's just like, sometimes your tweet just doesn't it land. Just, it's like, just, gar it's no good. Yes. And yeah, it's just like. And the other thing is like, um, like <laughs> there's a funny tweet that I saw like not that long ago and someone was like, if you barf out 10 tweets about the same topic, eventually one of them will stick. <laughs> and it's true. You know what I mean? Like try, try being ironic, you know, with a post, like instead of just being like, this is bothering me. What an outrage. You know, look, there's tons of that on, mm -hmm. on Twitter. I like to like get a, get a nice image, you know, and then use the image to like create um, like a sort of scene and then I'll write in the Twitter thing um, a dialogue between the two people in the image, right? And I'll have it be very ironic or very sarcastic, right? And just use a bit of satire. People like that kind of stuff. If you have good images along with something that's like, you know, quirky and intelligent and, and funny, um, that tends to do very well. People are on Twitter to be entertained. They're not there to be finger wagged at right mm. so keep it light keep it funny try it don't lose your sense of humor like mm -hmm. people don't people don't go on social media to like um well, i guess some people go on social media to learn things right it's good to spread information that's um useful to you but it can be a dark place social media and mm. i think that some of the accounts that are the best that i like to follow are ones that keep their sense of humor and they entertain me and they, they make me think differently about uh, things that, you know, everyone might be talking about, but they all have the same take, you know? Awesome. 
Well, I really appreciate your time. I know I've said that already. Uh, CC Bucko mm -hmm. is my guest follower on Twitter, searcher on YouTube. And just on the way out, anything that you'd like to say as far as recruiting women to your show? What are you looking yeah. for? Uh, I know that uh, if I choose to identify as a woman tomorrow like Zuby did with the deadlift, I'm, I probably won't get picked up on your show. I'd love to be on your show. <laughs> maybe maybe your show goes away from girl talk. No, we're, uh, we're turfs. <laughs> turf. Speaking of turfs. <laughs> Uh, Megan Murphy, I, I don't know. She's, I, I interviewed her uh, about a year ago, I think, and I, I've been trying to stay up with what she's up to, but she's the first one that said turf. I had no idea what a turf was, but um, she certainly made a splash there and seems to continue to ride it. I see that she was overseas speaking uh, yeah. the other day. Uh, I'm entertained by her. She's a, a lefty, but she's different. And I appreciate her yeah. take on some of her stuff. I joke all the time that if I had to be a feminist, I would be a turf. <laughs> <laughs> now you don't, you, am I right? You, that you don't see, I always identified as a feminist, but now I think it's much, much less needed. I, I used to think that, oh, you feminism know, this has done serious damage to women mm. and to society. Mm. No, feminism is bad, okay? Like, I, I'm sick of this, like, you know, oh, feminism is good um, as long as it's just about uh, work equality or just about um, the, the vote. No, it's not good, all of it. And, like, mm. that's, like, another hour conversation. So I don't know if you yeah. want to get into that. No, no, like, I want to respect your time. I know it's late over there, so I really appreciate your time. And, um <laughs> Uh, well, I something that we talk about on my um, Girl Talk series quite a bit, okay. um, how, you know, the family unit, um, like women, women got to vote when their husbands would vote because they would vote as a family. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, that's how women should vote. So women, the women who um, get a vote are the ones who have the right morals and the right, uh, choose the right lifestyle in that they become mothers and wives. Um, and obviously, like, if, if you have a workforce, right, and then there's a wage for that workforce, and then you double the workforce, what happens to wages? They go down, right? So the only people that really benefited from women entering the workforce, in my personal opinion, is the corporations and the employers and the elite that got to drive down wages for everyone and make it so that, you know, a, a single family can't survive on one income anymore, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, we talk about these sorts of things, um, all the time on my Girl Talk series from the fem female perspective. If you're a Canadian woman or a Christian woman or just a feminine woman and you're sick of the uh, mainstream, you know, pop feminism perspective and you just want some fresh ideas, um, check out my Girl Talk series because I interview not just right wing women, but sometimes, um, you know, c centrist women and um, women who wouldn't necessarily consider themselves nationalists. Some women do consider themselves nationalists. I think I have a nice variety. Of That's women. a tough one to broach these days. The nationalists, uh, you know, the mm -hmm. I know Faith Goldie comes out with this quite a lot. I know she takes a yeah. lot of heat for saying, you know, what my culture is sure important does. to me, and uh, her Christian views and all that. And this idea that you know, I, I once had a lefty, an NDP candidate uh, here, who's now a city councilor. Uh, he just moved to make uh, tampons free in city uh, facilities. Um, he <laughs> and there was a, an incidence where the pro-life people were on the corner. I don't know if you've seen this, but in my community, the pro-lifers come out and they carry these graphic images of aborted babies. Yeah, and, I don't like that. And and uh, you know, I don't like that either. It makes me, you know. It, it just destroys me inside. Yeah. Um, even though uh, I'm kind of on their side, abortion's a really bad thing, and it's taken way too lightly. Um, mm. So, but the, the, there was an incident. A man approached these people and kicked over, like kicked their signs and booted and broke all their signs up. Well, that's assault, right? Yeah. So I'm in stand favor. For property too. I stand for free speech far more mm. than I stand for anything else. So if these guys want to bring their signs out, they have all the right to do that. Do I agree with it? It's probably not the tactic I would take. And I spoke out and my now counselor told me that if I, if I put, I said, oh, so free speech over assault for me, because, mm -hmm. you know, I, I don't think he should have assaulted. That's a crime. They weren't committing a crime. And he labeled me a woman hater because... <laughs> Because, because I'm because I'm not because I'm not fond of abortion, and I'm like he, he like he, this is where the it always breaks down for me. 
You know, like you can't think about how twisted that is. That's so twisted though. Mm -hmm. Like think about the logic of that, that you have to support, um, women's like the, the business enterprise of, of women having abortions, um, to be in support of women. That's just the most like demonic thing Mm. in the entire world. Like it's not the thing, the thing about abortion is that, um, I do like, I think both sides kind of get some things right and some things wrong. Yeah. There are extreme arguments on both sides are ridiculous. I would agree with that. And there are some circumstances where I think that an, an early term abortion, which is not paid for by the government, I think women should be responsible for paying for their own abortions. Um, I also think, um, like early in the term, um, like, you know, uh, first term abortion would be the, would be another regulation. I think, um, you know, I think it is fair to call it, uh, a form of healthcare. You know, if the child is going to have severe disabilities, is going to be living in suffering for its entire life, right? Wow. Some women are saints and they say, I'm willing to make that child's life as, you know, comfortable as possible for as long as possible. I'm taking that burden on, you know, let them do that. But if there are women out there who, who believe that um, bringing a child into this world um, so they can look after it while it's living in suffering is not the best option for their family, they should be able to take that option, I think, as long as they're responsible about it and they do it early in the term and they pay for it themselves. Mm. Um, there's also the element of like ectopic pregnancies, which are life threatening. Um, these, uh, these pregnancies, they, they get sort of stuck in the fallopian tube. Right. And if the baby develops there, the woman can be made infertile. This is that, that's a healthcare issue, right? Mm-hmm. And the, the procedure is very similar to an abortion, um, when it's not ectopic, when they remove that also like when well, one in five pregnancies end in, in miscarriage and the procedure that we call abortion a DNC is technically the same procedure for evacuating a miscarriage pregnancy, which the body cannot release itself. Right. Mm. So it's literally the same process, the same procedure. So there is this kind of like, there is this gray area that I think the right miss out on because they're like, it's not healthcare to kill babies. And it's like, well, that's not the art. That's not the argument that I think everyone on the left is making. There Mm. are some, you know, um, complications with various types of pregnancies where a woman who is responsible and, uh, goes to the doctor early enough can deal with it through the medical sector. And I think that that's fine. I don't think that's a moral issue. Um, what I don't like is this, like you said, the shout your abortion. I'm proud of my abortion. I can have as many abortions as I want. My first abortion was my favorite one. Yeah, like this kind of stuff. Like that I should have had an abortion. <laughs> that harms <laughs> women because, like, think. women who have abortions, majority of them actually do. Um, they, I think, a lot. Maybe not majority. I shouldn't speak without knowing this uh, for sure because I don't know it for sure. But I would imagine that there are women out there who have abortions and they struggle deeply, mm-hmm. right? Because it's it's not something that I think is an enjoyable experience. No. And by minimizing the severity and the trauma of something like going through an abortion, you um, you you sort of neglect um, the psychological aftermath of having an abortion, which would shame a woman into seeking help if she wanted to get help because she was dealing with depression or shame or guilt as a result of doing it. The, 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 the solution isn't destigmatizing abortion, no. right? It's giving that woman health care and having a real conversation about you know, the trauma and how heartbreaking and devastating having an abortion probably is. Mm-hmm. I think every animal in the kingdom... Uh, when it suffers a uh, miscarriage or the death of a litter, mm-hmm. uh, it feels emotionally attached to that death. Of so uh, you know, how can it be any different for humans to say, oh, well, no, I uh, just, uh, and, you know, Crowder had a hidden camera there a couple months ago, somebody that had a nine month abortion done and sat in the waiting room at uh, Planned Parenthood. Oh, I didn't I saw even, that. Yeah, and, and and spoke about how her husband wasn't on the same page as her. And, like, I can't even imagine your husband saying, no, honey, we should have this kid. And her, like, it, it's a sensitive See, that's topic. that's something but. that I really disagree with. People people make the argument that, like, um, the, child is on, the child's life is only of value if it is wanted. 
right? That's something like if, if a woman is six weeks pregnant or whatever and then has a miscarriage and she wanted that baby, those same liberals would be like, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. Like, this is so traumatic and this is so bad. But if a woman is six weeks pregnant and she doesn't want the baby and then she goes to have an abortion, it's like, yeah, you go, girl, mm. get it done. You know, like so there's this kind of there's this inconsistency with um, terms, I think, on the left that drives the right crazy and rightfully so. Um, but, you know, I don't know. It's, it's such a complicated, it's such a complicated topic. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. it's really hard to navigate and I get a lot of flack because mm -hmm. I'm a Christian and I try to find where the middle ground is, um, right. for the benefit of women on this issue. Right. And it's not fun, you know, but, uh, it's not a fun topic. But, you know, it is definitely probably like when you were talking about how conversations were happening badly, mm -hmm. that is number one. No, maybe immigration is number one and then that's number two. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, Robin, I love you. I'm proud of you. And Thank I you. really appreciate your work. I think you've got a great sense of humor. I, I, I sense a great strength within you. Uh, and I, I really you. give you props for that. You're one of my favorite accounts on Twitter. On the way out. You could have any woman on Girl Talk, any woman. Who are you? Who are you gunning for now? That's still alive and available to come on the show. Like somebody that you would really. Um. Okay. So actually. Other I than just, Amy Benjamin. So one girl that I really want that I haven't secured is uh, Soph, and she's not really a woman. She's like a fourteen-year-old girl who's kind of like. Have you heard of this? No. This person, Soph. Soph. Uh, I'll I'll DM you a link okay. um, of her content because it's extremely edgy. But she's like 14 years old, and so she wow. has the left in this tailspin. Right? Really? Is she just, conservative? Uh, it's a, she's a comedian. Oh, she's okay. an entertainer. So she says things that are edgy, right? She says things that are like very, like. They'll catch you off guard because she's just this little tiny 14 year old girl. Cool, cool. Um, and she's being attacked by grown men who are journalists in the mainstream media. So I want to, I want to, I would love to talk to her, okay. but I haven't made contact with her yet. Someone who I really want to have contact that I just have made contact with that you can watch out for is Lindsay Shepard. She's going to be on my, uh, my, my podcast in the next couple weeks, which I'm really excited about. You tell her has said hello. I've been chasing <laughs> her as well. I know she just had a baby, but you know yes. what? if you don't want to come on the show, just say, I don't want to do your show. Don't give me all kinds of, excuses. I'm still going to chase her. Lindsay, I love <laughs> you too. Uh, what a champion she has been for, uh, yes. you know, just, would seem, maybe I got it all wrong, pretty girl, seems mild-mannered, but mm -hmm. has this fight, this fire that won't yes. freaking die. And just last night or the day before, well, she was uh, she was before uh, a House of Commons committee or something, at Parliament, yeah. and and I just, I sent her a message, said, hey, I love you, keep, you know, keep your chin up, I feel like your last tweet maybe you just needed someone to say hey i love you so from st Catharines, <laughs> you know here you go i give you a little bit of it but uh got a lot of time for her too she opened my eyes zuby asked me when i got red pilled uh and all i could think of was the left's reaction to jordan peterson yeah that, that was like when that trans activist came up and said are you okay with nazis being at your rally and he just said i don't like nazis like, yeah, yeah. What are you know, like <laughs> what's your problem? And I think that's where I started to snowball. And, yeah. and I'm grateful for it because, you know, like I said earlier, I, I mean, I, I at least pat myself on the back enough to go, you know what? I struggle with those beliefs that I used to have. I'm not that guy anymore. And that's okay. You know, better to be open-minded and flexible to change your opinion on something to just be, nope, that's the way it is, and I'm never changing. You know, like, come on. That's not that's no way to go through life with blinders on. So, I agree. Thank you so much for having me on. Um, no, you're I welcome. hope we can have a chat again sometime in the future. Awesome. And I hope that you can red pill all the Canadian boomers out there because <laughs> we, we, we really need that to happen. <laughs> Thanks, Robin. Catch her at... CC Bucko on Twitter and Critical Condition on YouTube. Robin, I really appreciate it. We'll talk soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right. Cheers. How do you shut this thing off now? There you go. She did it for me. Okay. CC Bucko if you need her. An hour and 51. Wow, that was a... Uh, time flies. Uh, she's over across the pond there. I thought she was in Ireland. No, she is not. And